järgmiseks ettekandjaks on, kuidas öelda, mitte meie vana sõber, vaid meie suur sõber, Riina, kes töötab Euroopa teaduskeskuses. Where it is? Tas it situate? Sevilla. Sevilla. Sevilla, jah. Aga enne, nii öelda, töötas ta Euroopen Skulnetis, mille kaudu me teda varem juba ammu-ammu, alates 2006. aastast tundma õppisime. Tema huvid, te loetelu on nii pikk, et ma ei teaks, ma hakkanki need ette lugema. Ma panin nendele mõned kirja siin, noh, näiteks. IKT koolis ja elupidevas õppes. Social computing, ma ei oskagi seda eesti keelda tõlkida. Sotsiaal arvutused. Nii siis e-õppe vahendid ja hariduslik multimeedium, siis andmeaidad, digitaalsed metaandmed, semantiline interoperablus ja nii edasi. Ja Riina, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, thank you very much. Tere, hyvää päivää. I think you will understand hyvää päivää if I say in Finnish. My Estonian is Tere. That's about the extent my Estonian. I'm sorry to apologize for that. So I'm here today to talk about the European Digital Competence Framework. So let's say that the discussions we heard this earlier this morning, they were very hands-on what happens in the classroom. So now for my talk, let's take a step back and look a little bit more what's the, what's the underlying framework? Why do we do this work? And also a little bit more the policy perspective. I work for the European Commission. European Commission uh, has, um, let me just, uh, here has um, seven research institutes called the uh, JRCs. And one of the institutes is based here in Sevilla. And that's the institute where I personally work as a research fellow now for last uh, two years. And I have another uh, one year to go. Uh, here you can see I work uh, in the unit called um, Information Society Unit. And there we are dealing with issues like um, inclusion, use of uh, e-services for healthcare, but also e-learning and skills. And part of that team, and we are about seven people working on the topic. So let's just get back here. So European Commission in-house science center, that's how we call JRCs. The, our remit to work for European Commission is to support any European policy with research and evidence. So that's our, our remit to work. Let me just give you an example about that. How could we support it? A couple of years back, there was a very big study at the European scale about the use of ICTs in schools. The, one of the big outcomes from that study, the survey, uh, was that 63% of nine-year-olds are missing digital equipment they need at school. So there is definitely a gap, there's lack of not only knowledge, and we also talked about teacher training, teaching um, with these new technologies, but really still the software is an issue still today in Europe. So software being an issue, another issue is the big lack of digital skills. Uh, I'll show you this survey data just uh, quickly now when we go back to the framework, how this data was constructed or what were the important key elements here when we talk about digital skills. But just to give you the idea of the magnitude of this problem in Europe with citizens in general is that 47% according to this Eurostat study, don't have digital skills needed to function in this society. Function, work, contribute back, be an active citizens, take advantage of e-services. That's huge. And that includes 23% that don't have any of the digital skills. 
I've underlined there or I've made a little note for Estonia because uh, I know when I look at the, any European graphs, I always want to see how Finland is doing. And actually, interestingly, when you look, Estonia is just there before the um, uh, European, uh, European uh, Union average of 28 member countries. And interestingly, when you look at the basic skills and above basic skills, digital skills in Estonia, they are actually quite well suited there. But that shouldn't let you be too comfortable with yourself because there's always room for improvement. So why does that matter? Why does it matter that about half of European citizens don't have the proper skills to take advantage of the society? E-society being part of the European Union, being part of the growth move, uh, we recently have a new European Commission college, and actually the, Euro the, the European Commissioner, the Vice President coming from Estonia, has a very, very important portfolio there for digital single market. And all that is to drive more jobs, growth, fairness, and democratic change in Europe. And in order to do that, we need to have the bottom skills set there. So I give you an outline of my presentation. In the upcoming 25 minutes, I will, talk in, I will describe to you what do we mean with digital competence? What do I mean when I'm talking about digital skills? I will introduce to you this big framework called the um, Digital Competence Framework for Citizens in Europe. I will give you some examples what can be done with that kind of a framework, and then just to end up, I will give you a few examples of future work that we in my research group in Sevilla are doing in order to support the European policy making at the, in the future, now, today, and in the future. So what do I mean when I say uh, digital competence? Digital competence is one of the key competencies that have been described in 2006 uh, by the European Commission. There are um, eight out there underlined. Uh, I hope you can see also in the back screens there, uh, things like communication in your own mother tongue, in foreign language, mathematical competence, science, learning to learn, social and civic competencies, sense of initiative and entrepreneurship, cultural awareness and expression. Like you can see the list is very varied. And if you think of digital competence, it is one of these key competencies. And how we de de define digital competence is that it's one of the transversal competencies. It allows you to acquire other competencies. It might allow you to communicate better in your mother tongue, learn other languages, upskill in mathematics, science, and so on. So that's why it has a really big importance, because it's something that enables us to acquire other competencies. You will have, by the way, the slides available. I will not do a flip classroom this time. I don't make you to read the slides before, but they are later available in the, in the in the slide share, so all the links, you can go back and look at the documentation a little bit more. So what does it really mean to be digitally competent in that case? It doesn't only mean that you know how to use ICT tools or any digital tools for that matter. Uh, we split it up in three different areas. There is um, one part of it is the skills. You have the operational skills to create a, a Word file, go and update your Instagram, whatever you want. But there are also important components that it's the knowledge. You understand what you're do doing and also attitudes. You have, for example, critical attitude towards using those tools. So all those three together create a competence. And how we say uh, in, the, in the, defin the definition from 2006, digital competence involves the confident and critical use of ICT for employment, learning, self-development, and participation in society. 
So if you think of a confident and critical use, and what do we see around now? Even if I said that there's a still a digital gap, lack of equipment in schools, it doesn't mean that students, pupils, young people don't have those tools. Many of them have smartphones, um, devices, so on, and they do a lot of stuff with them because they are all the time clued to the screen. But unfortunately, we have also a growing amount of evidence showing that actually those tools are not helping us always get what we think would be useful. For example, here, scientists link selfies to narcissism, addiction, and mental illness. So is that what we want from the future? Another interesting tweet that I saw in the in an irrelevant context, let's say, but I thought it was very well said. Um, as I mentioned, I live in Spain now, and youth employment is huge there, especially in Andalusia, the south of the country. It's, it's a problem. And here, 100% youth is connected to internet, 50% unemployed. That is a real paradox, and that really makes you think, what do those digital tools, environment, the connection, so on, what do they give us? So that, let me lead into the creation of a digital competence framework. And of course, that was exactly what the European Commission was thinking. We need a better framework that we know what to, what to expect, what to teach, and how to assess that. The digital competence framework was done uh, already. We started the work in 2010. It was finalized 2012, uh, and 2013, the first um, version came out. Uh, this work was originally uh, done for the European Commission's Directorate General Education and Culture. But now, with the new commission, we continue working actually for employment because digital skills, like I was mentioning already in the beginning, to giving you that political context where we are working now in Europe, skills is really part of that jobs and growth. So that's just to give you an idea, but let's look into it because you might think that this is just some political uh, uh, policy level strategic planning that doesn't have anything to do with you as a teacher in classroom. Let's get into it and look what's there. I'm gonna skip that one. We already looked at the definition. Just to summarize the definition that it is in your head. Digital competence is set of knowledge, skills, and attitudes. I talked about those three that are required when using ICT digital media tools to perform tasks, solve problems, communicate, manage information, collaborate, create and share content, and build knowledge. Now, that's a really, really heavy task there. And for what purpose? For work, leisure, participation, learning, socializing, being part of the society. So the framework is created out of five areas. And those five areas together will allow you to get the digital competence. Like you see, it's only one digital competence and it's combined of five areas. The areas being information processing, communication, content creation, the safety aspect, but also very importantly, solving problems using digital tools in digital um, areas, digital environments. So those are the five areas which further have been divided into 21 different competencies. So each area, if we look at information, for example, it has three different competencies that define that area. First competence, you should be able to know how to browse, search, and filter information on the internet. Second competence, you should be able to evaluate information that you acquire. Third competence, storing and retrieving information. It's not only good to consume it, you might want to save it on your computer, you might want to be, you need to be able to find your own files back, and further on, we go to communicating, we go to interacting with people, what do you do with knowledge? It's about sharing, so 
One of the competencies, for example, is interacting through technologies, sharing information and content, uh, engaging in online citizenship, collaboration through digital channels, and so on and so on. So each of the area has been defined, has defined the exact competencies that should be acquired at a certain level in order to be digi digitally competent. So to be digitally competent, you have to know something about all those 21 areas. Actually, when I was showing you the earlier slide, it uses the same framework. And when we said that people don't have these skills or have only basic skills, it might need that it might it means that they might be able to create content, but they that's all. They have skills only in one sub area and not all across the sector, which is also better than nothing, of course, but a problem. So like I said, um, I, I'll give you now first how this framework really is constructed so you have a better idea how you can then use it yourself. Uh, the area of information I already mentioned has three competencies. Each competence has been defined by a definition. Browsing, searching, filtering information to access and search for online information, to articulate your information need, to know how you actually write the search word, keywords, for example, in Google, uh, how to find relevant information. And now that, of course, is linked somewhat to evaluating information. There's a lot of information that you find on the internet, but how do you know that that's the relevant part that you're looking for? Be uh, effective uh, in your work, navigate between online uh, searches, and, in, and to create personal information strategies. So that's how we have defined each of those 21 competencies to say exactly what is needed. After that, this looks really ugly. I'm not spending much time on it. But here was the definition. And after that, what's really important, we have defined in this framework three proficiency levels. What does it mean to be at the level A? What does it mean to be at the level B, which is the intermediate user? And what does it mean to be advanced user in this area? And furthermore, because it's not always clear from a definition, we go down and we give examples. What does it really mean to have knowledge in the competence 1.2, for example? So you can read here, can analyze, retrieve information, evaluates media content. Those are typical knowledge examples. And then here we have skills example, is able to deal with something. You have the action verbs there. So I have, these slides will be available so you can look at the way all the competencies have been defined. Uh, and you can also find, the, find the, um, the report yourself for your later use. So I'm not gonna spend exactly now time on defining each one of them, but we can look at how and what you can do with that kind of um, kind of um, uh, framework. So we talked about youth and them having, uh, you know, uh, maybe using, uh, well, the narcissism, the problems of having devices and how do you use it. With the same framework and data from the study that I mentioned earlier, the ICT study in the classrooms, we are able to look uh, how in our framework, the digital competence framework, how digitally competent the youth, in this case, eighth grade students, are in their ICT skills. Okay, the, the <laughs> picture the, the has a little bit shifted, but Estonia is here, up here, and you can see the blue one means uh, it's related to safety, red one is related to information processing, uh, green one content creation, and then lila is communication skills. And Estonians are really high up here if you look on the top, but when you look at the scale, how confident are you using ICTs? Actually, number three only says, I'm somewhat confident. So we still have work to be done 
it's a good result for Estonia in a way, but there's still work to be done in different areas. So that's one use of a big uh, framework like that. It allow, allows us to assess where we are. Once you know you have assessed where you are, you can discover what are the knowledge, skills, uh, gaps that there are, and you can plan training. But also, how do you do the, how do you, okay, I, I showed you data from a big data, but how do you assess yourself? Our framework is a reference framework, but there are some people who already took it up and have developed tools around it. Um, here's one uh, link. You might want to even uh, go and take the test yourself. This was, um, this is done in uh, Basque Country in Spain. And they are using our framework to create the whole digital uh, agenda for the Basque Country, which will be re re <coughs> related not only to um, skilling up, but also possible employment in the future, and also um, just the digitally being able to be part of actively part, taking part in the society. And they have a little tool there, it takes about 15 minutes, and you can assess yourself based on our competence framework. Another implementation will be part of Europass. How many of you know Europass? Uh, some people do. Uh, Europass is another European Union um, initiative to uh, harmonize a little bit how to define your education and your CV, your curriculum, and so on. So here you have the Estonian website, and it will actually have um, a tool to do very quick self-assessment of your digital skills so that as part of your Europe Pass, you will be able to say, like you say, your learn, uh, language skills are at certain levels. You can say in the same way that your digital competence are in certain level. You can say in information process, I actually thought that I'm a basic user, but when it comes to using uh, digital tools for communication, I am a proficient user, and so on. So there are a few tools out there right now already, or coming out, that can be used to self-assess yourself using our framework. And also, if you download the, the whole uh, report, we have this interesting, it's a very rough version here, but we are working actually by the end of the summer to make a better version of it, defining what kind of um, the questions, what you should know, and how you can get from level A to level B. So this gives you also little personal strategies to upskill yourself from basic levels to intermediate and so on. Uh, this can be also uh, used to support countries uh, making, their, making better policies. Like I already mentioned, the part of Basque country in Spain using it for their own strategy. Uh, here I have a little map where we have more information. Here's the Basque country. You have, again, the link. You can go directly there. But also the Ministry of Education in Spain has created their teacher professional training program around our tool. And uh, you can see we have Flanders who are using it. Um, in Malta, they have used it as a green paper to allow them to reflect strategies and so on. So that is another type of use, not exactly in the classroom use, but it gives you an idea again how such framework can be used at different levels. But also, really, it can be used also in a classroom to create um, learning activities. How many of you know eTwinning? Yay! I worked, used to work in eTwinning a lot, so uh, uh, might no, my big, my heart goes for eTwinning. So here in eTwinning, uh, for you guys, you probably don't know, it's a big program where schools can find, uh, teachers can find a fellow teacher in another country to do a little classroom activity, school thing, using ICT tools. Usually teachers come up with their own ideas, but there's also a possibility if they don't know what to do, they can go and look at the project kits where they get ideas what kind of classroom activities we could do with our fellow students in another country so that we can get started. Terrible 
resolution. <laughs> but here is a gallery you can uh, go by uh, which subject area you want to look at. Let's take this, A Taste of Math, a project called Atom. Some of you might know it was a very, it's a very nice uh, project. One of the start, when you start, the whole kit describes the process, what you do, and so on. Here, I'll just give you an example. The teachers next launch a logo contest. So the students have to create a logo proposal, either hand-drawn or using special, special sites or software. Uh, brainstorming activities can help give all the participants an opportunity to get started and going on. So if we look at that example, there is already, already tasks that can help you as a teacher to make sure that you are developing digital competencies for your pupils in different areas. Evaluating information. You have a photo contest, they have to look at the, you have a con logo context, I'm sorry, you have to look at the logos and decide which one is a working one, which one is a good, which one you want to have. You're developing content already because you're developing the logo. You might use some special software, you might hand draw, you might take pictures, so on. Storing and retrieving information, you want to share your versions, you maybe have different drafts that you're uh, doing and then you evaluate one, you choose one and then you continue doing that. So that gives you already an exercise in that area. Innovating and creatively using technologies, of course you're innovating, you, you have to come up with the logo. So that's a creative use again uh, of your own mind, but also using then ICT tools to help you collaboration through digital channels. In this case, remember, the other part of students, other class might be in a different country, so you have to um, make up a way to, to really talk, talk with them, make the voting, and so on. But also, importantly, the copyrights and licenses, because oftentimes when kids start this kind of exercise in a school, they might just go on the web, do a Google search, start downloading images from there. So this gives you as a teacher also a possibility to discuss what does actually a copyright mean, what kind of uh, content can you use, reuse, so on. And also what kind of license, if you want to go there, you want to put on your logo. So th that's just to give you an idea that this framework is really also useful in the classroom for you as a teacher. So, yes. As it is, it can be useful for you to help your students gain those competencies. But at the same time, we are also worried about what are the other competencies that teachers should have to be able to teach, teach with these new technologies. And there's a lot of that pedagogy that was already mentioned. And so maybe we have to do the work defining um, the pedagogical area for teachers to implement actually these, uh, these uh, project work, use of different tools, collaboration, knowledge building, and so on in the classroom. So our next work that is starting this year, October, with the research group, is to actually look at the digital competence framework as it is now, look at teachers' job, and see what other competencies are needed so that teachers can fully function in this new digital environment. So we will be first looking at those countries I was telling you about uh, Spain, but also here in Estonia. Maybe you didn't know, but there is also work going on around this, both digital competence for pupils and digital competence for, for uh, teachers. There are also ongoing work, other frameworks, other projects that are doing work like um, UNESCO, of course, the, is a big teacher digital the ICT use framework for teachers, but also, um, yeah, there are tools that we will look at and take the best, make a big meta framework. So that work, unfortunately, will not be available to you right now. It's a two-year uh, two project, so it will be, I will need another invitation here. <laughs> so, but we don't stop with, um, with the teacher. There is only so much that the teacher can do because it's one classroom out of a whole institution. We are also interested how could 
a whole educational organization be supported, be helped to be digitally competent. So we have just recently started another two-year project to come up with the framework of what we call um, digitally innovative educational organizations. And um, just to give you an idea, we are not only looking at what teachers do uh, with pupils, learning teaching activities, uh, teaching practices is one part of such framework. Uh, learning practices then could be another part, but knowing that uh, when working with, uh, we already had actually mentioned, somebody mentioned the strategy papers, for, for example, what's the vision of your school for ICT use? Uh, so in this framework, we try to find the key uh, elements that will support schools creating that kind of vision, uh, building in ICT not only in some random, act, random activities, but actually all across the activities that you do in the administration, communicating with parents outside of school, and so on. So that's uh, just to give you an idea that uh, we're keeping ourselves uh, very busy in my research group and there's uh, interesting work we have done and interesting work that we are going to be uh, carrying out in the future. And that's actually the ending slide for my time. And uh, as I said, the slides are available. You can download them there to get to those links that I mentioned uh, earlier. And thanks, everybody. Thank you, Rina. <laughs> no need. Varun. It's after lunch. Yeah, uh, yeah. Everybody's so, probably taking the siesta like uh, we do in Spain. So may I start? Yes, please. So you mentioned that. <coughs> just a moment. Uh, digital competence framework. Uh, my question is, uh, to what extent it is related to European e-competence framework, or um, exactly. does it at all? Is it yes. at all? Yes. So. What uh, uh, was mentioned here is e-competence framework for ICT professionals. Mm -hmm. And that's not really, uh, there's lots of overlap because we are talking about partly the same set of skills, but as you already see from the name of the framework, we are aiming at the whole population, really the idea of a lifelong learning uh, in the future in lots of other jobs than the ones that are in the ICT sector, you will need to have some kind of digital skills. So we are talking about much, much wider range of skills. And I would like to emphasize this, uh, the problem solving part is actually something where you have this uh, creatively solving problems that come up that you can use digital tools is something that these other frameworks seldomly mention. And if we look at the, the, the needs of the society, what uh, is nowadays said about the jobs, for example, that's one of the skills that uh, is really needed. So our framework allows to be a little bit wider in the, that sense. But the general structure of those frameworks seems to be similar. Very similar, very similar. And we have actually taken aboard a lot of work that was already done mm -hmm. for um, that framework. Uh, you mu there they go very um, much deeper also in the operational skills, know how to use certain database tools. Uh, they might give names of software, whereas our framework remains at a very uh, generic level, so we don't mention knows how to make PowerPoint presentation in you know, Word, because maybe in five years' time, there's totally different set of tools. And we talk about, um, on an other li li little bit higher level, about those skills, which makes our framework maybe a little bit more life, uh, long learning sort of focused. Oh yeah, thank you. Really? <laughs> That's <laughs> People seem to be very, very sleepy. <laughs> <laughs> That's normal after, after lunch break. Maybe we should do some physical exercises in, be in between. Some? some physical ex exercises now. Physical exercise, Th yeah. that's a good idea, actually, to get some uh, oxygen in our brains and... Uh, maybe you just Maybe 
maybe need example. to do it. Okay, <laughs> everybody, hands up. Yay! And turn to your colleague either side and give them high five. <laughs> give it both colleagues high five. <laughs> And take also time to stretch. I see some people are stretching. That's very good. You might even stand up and a uh, little bit uh, pull your legs out and just uh, be uh, ready for the next presentation. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Yeah.